Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you today and we look at this story that we've heard lots of times, I pray that you'll help us to understand it more deeply and understand more of who Jesus is. Fill me with your spirit so I speak clearly and each one of us with your spirit so that your spirit um, helps us to understand deeply in our heart your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're probably familiar with this. Well, well first, let, let me tell you a story. Um, it's about a dog. And there was this dog that came to a butcher shop. And it stood outside the butcher shop just staring at the case of meat. And so one of the butchers decided to come out and talk to it and just said, hey, you look like you're kind of interested in some of that meat. And the dog went, Roof! It almost seemed like that dog understood what I was saying. He says, well, what, what are you looking for? Are you looking for, you know, hamburger or maybe like a roast or steak? And the dog went, Roof! Roof! He says, you want steak? Roof! Says, well, okay, well, you know, how much do you want? Do you want like a pound, a pound and a half, two pounds? Roof! Roof! So, well, two pounds, two pounds. Well, he looks and he sees that uh, he's got a little pouch here. He's got a little money. So he takes the money out of it. And it's enough for two pounds. So he ties it up and gives it to the dog, you know, sells the dog the, the meat. Well, the dog doesn't eat it. It just carries the package and carries it back home. And he goes up. It's three floors. And it goes upstairs. And it gets up to the, the top of three floors. It starts scratching on a door. And he's watching this guy. And the guy comes out. And the guy's mad. as I'll get out at the dog. He says, you stupid mutt. He says, what are you talking like that to that dog? That's the smartest dog I've ever seen. He says, you call him smart? This is the third time this week he's forgotten his keys. <laughs> he wasn't very thankful, right? He doesn't have that, that smart dog. So uh, the, the whole point of it is, is if, if there is a point, I'm not even sure there is a point, but, but the point of it is that, that it's about thankfulness. And we've heard this story about the, the, the thankful leper. In fact, uh, even uh, Arch Books, that's the Lutheran books, you know, that come out, even has a story about the thankful leper. And when we tell this story, we tell that Thanksgiving, and it seems like the story goes like this. There were ten lepers who were healed, and they all go off, and one of them's a good guy. He comes back and says, thank you. And so the point is, be like him, and you go say thank you. Well, it kind of sounds like a moral tale, doesn't it? It doesn't really sound like the kind of thing the gospel tells us. Um, and, and yeah, that's one level you can look at that story, but that sure seems awfully, um, I don't know, just seems awfully shallow. It's kind of like when you tell your kid, say thank you to Annie Gladys, right? Say thank you. And, and I'm not sure that's exactly what's happening here. It's happening in the book of Luke. So let's, let's look at it a little deeper and see if there's anything else we can get out of it. Read with me. While traveling to Jerusalem, he passed between Samaria and Galilee. Now this is Jesus, and he's traveling, and I've got a map up there. And you see where Galilee is, and you see where Samaria is, and you see where Jerusalem is. So wouldn't the natural way to say, when he was traveling from Galilee through Samaria, to Samaria and the boundary or something like that, instead he starts with Samaria and goes to Galilee, which is odd. When you're reading the Bible and you find an odd way of saying something, you shouldn't expect it to be a, a mistake. Usually the author is thinking something. What he's trying to do is set up this story. He's saying, look, in this boundary between Samaria, which is where there are people that are not Jewish, the Samaritans are kind of half Jews, and Galilee, where the Jews live, in this boundary, there's something happening here. And there's going to be a story that's going to be about the, the difference between the Jews and the not Jews at this point. So he kind of sets up the story that way. Read with me. As he entered a village, ten men with leprosy met him. We always translate it that way, leprosy, because that's the traditional way to, to translate it. Um, it probably wasn't what we call leprosy now, Hansen's disease, you know, where people can't feel in their fingers, and so they end up knocking off their fingers and their faces. And it's just a nasty disease. Um, I, I was going to go on a bunny trail there, but I'm not going to go on it. Uh, but but it, it is a nasty, terrible, awful uh, disease. But probably this refers to any real serious skin disease. You know, those skin diseases that made you impure so you couldn't go to the temple. They also made you so you couldn't live around other people because you'd make them impure. So usually these folks would live outside of towns, and they kind of grab them and make their own little communities. And so they were outcasts. They were people that were outside. And so now in this boundary community, you've got people with leprosy, and there are some probably from Galilee, and they're Jewish people, and some that are from Samaria, and they're Samaritans, which are, are not Jewish people, and they're, they're kind of probably joined together because, you know, they're all outcasts, so why not be outcasts together? 
read with me. They stood at a distance and raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So they see Jesus going to the village, and they catch him, and they say, Hey, Jesus, Master. Now, it's really interesting because they use this term Master, and in Luke, when they use this term Master, the only people that use it are disciples, except for these guys. They're the only people. So these guys have the kind of faith that the disciples have. They see Jesus as their master. They understand that. A lot of times the other nine that don't come back and give thanks, they get a bad rap, but they, they really saw Jesus as somebody special. And they, they call out to him and say, hey, you know, have mercy on us, which means we're in a terrible, awful situation. We need your pity. We need you to help us. And we recognize that you can help us. So that's what happens. It's exactly what we need. We all need to have Jesus' mercy. Now, we may not have a skin disease, but we have another disease, and that disease is the disease of sin, and every one of us struggles with that, right? We've got things that we wish were different in our life. We talked about that last week. There are different things that we wish were different out there in our world, but there's also things we wish were different in here. Man, I would like to be able to live up to my own standards. I'd like to just be the person I would like to be, but I fall short of that much less standing up to God's standards. And so we have this problem, and so we need to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, help us. Help us figure out how to deal with this problem. Read with me. When he saw them, he told them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And while they were going, they were cleansed. So the priest would have to announce that you were better so that you could get back into society go live in the village again. So they're going to do this, and as they're going, as they're being obedient to what Jesus said, What did Jesus say? Go to the priest. They start to do it. They listen to Jesus' word. They do what he tells them to do. And in the process, they're healed. That's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. He says, I love you. I died on the cross for you. I am forgiving you all of your sins. Now just live out that life of love. And as we go about it, he does the cleansing inside of us. Nothing we do on our own. But as we go about being faithful to his word, he does the cleansing. As we faithfully respond to Jesus' word, he cleanses us and makes us new people, just like those lepers, just like those, those uh, people with the skin disease. So as we go along our way being faithful to Jesus, he's continually doing that work inside of us, always working inside of us. Read with me. But one of them, seeing that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice gave glory to God. Now I love this. One of them comes back, and what does he do? Read it. What does he do? Gave glory to God. Now, this is interesting because Luke uses this throughout the, the book of Luke. There are actually eight times in which God is, is uh, noted as being glorified. And the first time is angels, and then there's seven people that glorify. Remember when the angels sing glory to God in the highest uh, Christmas? You guys have all been there, saw that Christmas program and stuff. Glory to God in the highest and peace, goodwill to, to people on whom his favor for rest. That doesn't translation. Right, so, so anyway, so that's the first part. And then the shepherds go see Jesus, and they glorify God, these outcast shepherds. And then you've got these guys that drop uh, the guy through the roof down to see Jesus, and when he gets healed, gives glory to God, right? And then you've got, um, you've, got, you've got a blind man. You've got this woman that's slumped over and is healed on the Sabbath and gives glory to God. You've got this story that we're talking about. Um, and there's a, the other story there is the, the dead boy, you know, the, the, the widow from Nain, and she's got a son, her only son, and Jesus heals him. And after he rises from the dead, what happens? They all give glory to God. So this is a response to what's happening. And it, you could say it's thanks. But it's in another level, it's recognizing who Jesus is in the midst of this. They're saying, whoa, God is working here. And the very last time, it's the climax of the gospel. Jesus has just died on the cross. And the Roman centurion, somebody you would never expect, says, glory to God. This guy surely was an innocent man. All of a sudden, he recognizes who Jesus is. And that gives us a clue to what Luke's doing all the way through. Giving glory to God means recognizing that Jesus is the one that has come into our world. In Hebrews, it says this. Read with me. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In other words, what it says is that Jesus basically is the glory of God. Glory is greatness revealed. It's revealing who God is. And in the person of Jesus, 
We see God here on earth. I mean, whatever that means, it's hard to get our minds around that. But Jesus here, he's actually showing who God is and how God cares about us. He's revealing God to us in a very special way. Jesus' life reveals the greatness of God. It's that, that's what it's all about. And this story is part of that bigger story of Luke where he's saying, look, people are starting. They're usually not the people you expect. They're these people that are, you know, kind of outsiders and, and outcasts, but they're recognizing that Jesus is somebody special. And it climaxes with that guy at the end who's a Roman soldier. And he's saying, yeah, 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 this is the guy, right? Read with me. He fell face down at his feet, thanking him, and he was a Samaritan. And that's where the thank you comes from, right? So after he's giving glory to God, he says, thank you, thank you. And that's part of his glorifying God. It's part of it. He's recognizing who Jesus is, and he's recognizing what he's done in his life, and he responds to that by giving thanks. But here's another special thing in the story, and he was a Samaritan. When you think of the good Samaritan in the Bible, what do you think of? The, the one that goes out and helps the guy, right? But this is the second good Samaritan. Why? Because he recognizes who Jesus is, and he gives glory to God. And he comes in and honors God by saying, you are the one, man. You're, you're the one that shows us who God is in this world. Read with me. Then Jesus said, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Didn't any return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Now, I never noticed this before. And if you would have asked me, I've read this story hundreds of times. I, I know that. I know I've read it hundreds of times. And if you would have asked me earlier this week, what did Jesus say? He said, weren't there nine healed and only one came back to give thanks? That's what I would have said. But what does it say? Give glory to God, which is bigger than thanks. It includes thanks. But he's coming back to honor God by recognizing how God is working in the world. And how is he working in the world? Through Jesus. So you're starting to understand that this is a bigger thing than just saying, hey, Karen, don't forget to say thank you. Right? I mean, it's bigger than that. God wants us to publicly recognize him, God, in the person of Jesus. Because that's exactly what this guy's doing. He wants us to recognize that in Jesus... You know, that's God at work in our world. Read with me. And he told him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has saved you. Jesus does this four times in the book of Luke. Four times. The first time that he does it is the woman who anoints his feet. You know, it's kind of, it might be a prostitute. We don't know. Some kind of sinful woman, according to the Pharisees. And, um... When she does that, everybody gives her a hard time, and Jesus says, go on your way. Your faith has saved you, right? And then you've got, you've got the woman that's in the crowd, you know, and she's been bleeding for, th for uh, 12 years. She reaches out and touches his tassel, and she gets healed, right? And after she gets healed, what happens? It happens. Jesus turns around and says, who did that? Who touched me? And she finally comes out and says, ah, I did it. I was healed. This is the story. And he says, your faith has healed you. Go on your way. And then there's a blind man, probably Bartimaeus. It said it doesn't, he isn't named in Luke as Bartimaeus, but he also comes to Jesus, throws away his thing, wants to follow him, and as soon as he, uh, and, and as soon as he is healed, Jesus says, your faith has healed you, right? Because of his faith of trying to reach out to Jesus. So I spent some time trying to think about this. I thought, well, what do all these have in common? One is they're kind of people that are outsiders, the people that the Jewish people don't quite get it, you know, the, the, the mainstream Jews. They're, you know, blind people and, and this Samaritan and this prostitute and this woman that's been unclean for years. They're outsiders because Luke always does that. But they, 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 their faith is they hold on to this Jesus. And this is what I came up with. Saving faith boldly approaches Jesus, recognizing him as God's instrument to make us whole. In all those cases, that's what it was. They saw that this was God's way of making them whole. And that's the same thing for us. When we see Jesus as our way to wholeness, our way to, in the, the Old Testament way of saying it would be shalom, when we see he's the one that can fix our hearts, he's the one can, that can deal with our sin problem, he's the one that can deal with, with who we are. When we see that and we understand that, that's true faith. We see Jesus hanging on the cross and we say, that is God. I can't understand it. I can't. It's, there's a mystery there, but it, in that way, I see that God loves me enough to die for me. Right? He loves me enough to take away my sin, and He loves me enough to make me His child. 
And in all of that, I honor God and glorify Him because He is working in and through Jesus. And so I think, as I've thought about that, I don't know for you guys, but for me, that, that really made the story a little bit deeper for me. To think it's more than just, hey, don't forget to say thank you. It's in Jesus, this Jesus, God is working in this world. And when we recognize that, we can't help but to give glory to Him. All right. So what have we learned? First, we all need Jesus to have mercy on us. As we faithfully respond to Jesus' word, he cleanses us. Jesus' life reveals the greatness of God. God wants us to publicly recognize him in the person of Jesus. Saving faith boldly approaches Jesus, recognizing him as God's instrument to make us whole. Any thoughts or comments before we reflect? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that's all the way through Luke. It's always the, the, the guy you would never expect that comes to Jesus. And Jesus is always reaching to those people that nobody else would reach to. Any other thoughts, comments? Thank you. Um, So this is the question for the week. This week, how will I publicly recognize Jesus as the one who makes me whole? How will I publicly, in other words, glorify God? Just think about that and then we'll pray. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for making us whole in Jesus. Thank you for helping us to to look into this story, to understand a little bit more deeply about what it means to give honor and praise to you, to glorify you by recognizing how you work through Jesus. Uh, Fill us with a spirit of faith that lives each and every day um, with that faith in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.